Hi, good morning, everybody. We are just about to bring on Dr. Naomi Marmon Grummet, who is the founder and executive director of the Eden Center or the Eden Center um, in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. And she has been working for years already in Israel and is bringing her programming to many other parts in the world um, to really make mikvah a better, more impactful, spiritual, just really um, enjoyable experience for so many. Um, and so we're really excited about having her here today. Um, she's just about to come on. Um, you know, I know this is an unusual time. It's Sunday morning, but we we really wanted to bring this to all of you because at a time when, you know, we've been talking about some really difficult conversations regarding mikvah and we're going to be having a number of different voices come on here and and give us some other pieces that we can hold on to that people can hold on to during their experiences that have been difficult. So let me grab her. Let me just make sure that she's on and grab her. Give me a second, guys. Okay, one second. I know. Here we go. Okay, so in the meantime, um, we're happy to take questions and happy to um, have anyone come on. And oh, here she is. Perfect. Okay. Hi, Hello, Amy. Amy. How are you? Thank God. How are you? I'm good. I, I know. Look, it's it's basically Hanukkah there already. And you are like, I, I think it's like actually really beautiful and symbolic that we're spending the moments that Hanukkah is really arriving in Israel and bringing its light that, you know, that we know that this holiday brings and talking about mikvah in a way that you've brought light to so many people. So I just really wanted to thank you. Um, so please introduce yourself. Okay, I am Dr. Naomi Marmon Grummet. I am the founder and director of the Eden Center, which works to empower women, strengthen marriages, and really make mikvah um, a place that we can talk about. We can talk about the issues that we all have as women and hopefully make the experience of mikvah better. Um, part of the Eden Center's mission is really to bring to light and bring to conversation the myriad of topics that happen around and you know, Amy, you've really been highlighting how um, infertility can come up so poignantly in the mikvah. The Eden Center really works to bring up all different kinds of topics because, as we know, there are lots of things that happen around mikvah, whether it has to do with fertility or our bodies and how we feel about our bodies, whether it has to do with sexuality or a million and one other things. So that's what the Eden Center works on. And thank you for allowing us to join the conversation. Uh, look, I, I mean, we've been talking about doing something like this for a while, and this was really the perfect time to have you, you know, come on and share your expertise. So, yes, while, I mean, we know, we all know, you know, because this is the work that you do, that there are so many different pieces that trigger women in regard to their experience on mikvah. You know, our community specifically focuses on the fertility piece. So, talk to us. And, and we've spent an incredible amount of time this past week, really sort of not, we can't begin to cover all of the different nuances, obviously, but we have covered a lot of the difficult topics surrounding fertility and mikvah. So I, I don't think we need to do that again. What I, I think what people are looking for is how what is, when people come to you, when people come to the Eden Center and, and when people get, like, you do a lot of training for the Balanites, for the mikvah attendants, you speak a lot about sensitivity. Talk to us about that piece first, about what your training is like for the attendants and how you sensitize them to deal with women who are going through some sort of fertility challenge. The truth is that I feel like so many of us have or at one stage or another have gone through infertility and sometimes, or a piece of it, right? Whether it's a loss, whether it's long-term infertility, um, 
just raising the sensitivity to how that can touch somebody at the mikvah specifically had already opens up a lot of doors in terms of people's ability to hold space for somebody else. I mean, it's totally legitimate. And no woman who comes to the mikvah has to be ashamed or has to, you know, God forbid, in any way feel you, you already have enough emotions coming up. You don't have to have somebody else making that more intense. So in terms of how a mikvah attendant can help, the most important thing is for her to just give you space to be. Um, and that's a lot of the training that we do. And whether you need to cry or whether you need to like get in, get out, just do, you know, not be there. Or whether you need to have somebody who is your friend who comes with you to be your mikvah attendant because you just don't want to be there alone. So those are the kind of things that we want to give mikvah attendants the sensitivity about um, that they can really make or break so much. You know, nobody should ever leave the mikvah being with a brachav. I hope I don't see you again for nine months because we don't know. Right. Um, and there, and oftentimes, especially, you know, there's so much talk about, you know, mikvah and fertility and, and a school of going with somebody who's pregnant. And even though those can be very wonderful and nice for some people, for some people that really doesn't speak to them and it hasn't helped them. Um, and for mikvah attendants to be sensitive that, to that also is really important because as much as for one person, we want to open that possibility for the next, you don't want to like put it in her face. <laughs> right. Um, right. And, and so how I, the, the question is, is, you know, when, like you, you like tease out a little bit of it like this, like we don't want to have the mikvah attendant say to a woman, like, I hope I don't see you again for nine months. Like, because we never know what the future holds. Right. And we can't, we can't predict. And, and sometimes like when someone is carrying something so difficult, whether they just lost a baby or whether they're going through infertility, like the, like having someone like they're already feeling this heightened sense of sort of like awareness and, and triggeredness of, you know, if we can use that as a word, and then someone can say something to sort of set them off. I, I guess what I also want to ask you is, you know, so many women that we've spoken to also have this idea that has been passed down to them, whether it was from their college teachers, their, their, the teachers who um, taught them initially the laws of mikvah and the laws of Tarat Hamashpacha, which is, I'm just explaining for everyone else, the laws of family purity, which talk about how you need to separate from your husband after you get your period, and then you can't reunite with him until after you dip in a mikvah. Um, so many women, in, specifically in regard to fertility, have this notion that like, if they don't do everything perfectly, if they're, if, if like, they don't check every little thing before they go in, if they miss one thing, if they like forgot X, Y, and Z, like they have this notion that they need to be OCD about, and, and I'm using that, like, not, I, 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 I no offense to the individuals who are struggling with any sort of mental disorder, but because of the laws that are put out in terms of the checking and in terms of the counting and in terms of the different things that we have to do in order to get to mikvah, many people feel that they're not able to get pregnant or that they have had a loss because they haven't done it perfectly. So can, so, you, can you speak a little bit about that? Well, I, you know, there are, and I will say, you know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe often uh, you know, told women to be more punctilious in this mitzvah. And there's sort of this idea that, you know, the more careful you are, but I don't believe that God punishes us or rewards us because of exactly how we do this or that. He doesn't punish us that now you're going to be infertile because you didn't check your fingernails well enough. I think that all women who are practicing going to the mikvah should do it with all their heart in the way that is right for them because otherwise, why are you doing it, right? So you have to do your practice and your and in your relationship, you have to keep the laws in the way that is best for you. And, you know, in consultation with your partner um, and whoever else you want to add into that mix. But I personally really do not connect to we're going to be punished for this or that. I think we do it with a whole heart. And then... Unfortunately, you know, 
sometimes we have to go through losses. But one of the things that I always find very moving when I get to the mikvah, like the mikvah is, you know, a pool of rainwater that is full of potential. It, the water connects to the water of creation, but it also connects, sorry, this is where I get emotional, to every single other woman in the Jewish community who has ever across space and time done this. And, you know, when you look back in Jewish history, unfortunately, we're not the first generation to suffer with infertility. And the cries and the tears of, you know, Sarah and Rivka and Rachel and Leah, they're not physically in that mikvah, but they connect to us in that time. And we can maybe, you know, hone into the fact that we're part of a long chain and for good and for bad, we bring down all the kohot, um, and and this is a time. So again, I prefer to connect to the women and the community and the power that we have um, to to do. Ev- the mikvah water gives us potential for everything. One potential is to bring life into the world through a baby, but another potential is to be creative in so many other ways. And if we can concentrate on the fact that that potential is also there. Like you can ask for the bracha of whatever you want. You can connect in whatever way you need. And sometimes the the unbelievable strength of also just saying, I'm here right now. I'm adding my tears to the tears of those who came before me. I don't know where it's going to lead to. Sometimes that can be really powerful too. You know, I, I have to say that I, I, I don't remember who it was. I th- I think it was um, one of my Rebbitsons, but somebody told me in the midst of my fertility journey that like I was sort of doing like all of the things surrounding mikvah and going to the mikvah sort of by rote. Like, you know, this is another thing that I have to do. Like I'm a Jewish woman. I choose to keep, you know, the laws the best way I know how. This is another thing that I need to do. I need to count. I need to watch. I need to wash. I need to clean. I need to do all the things. And like, this is another thing that I have to do. And it became very painful, you know, in the months after my miscarriages to have to come to the mikvah at a time when I thought I was going to be pregnant. And so then to be there instead of having a baby in my body was just horrific. And one of my rebbitsons told me, she said, and I had never conceived conceived of mikvah in that way. And it's exactly, you know, taking off what you just said. I, she said, you can use that time when you're in the water to pray and to cry and that you can have as much time as you want. Like, yes, obviously, if you're in a very large mitzvah and, you know, there, it sort of runs like a m- machine, like everybody needs to be in and out and like you need to get there and you get in and out because there are 12 other people waiting behind you who all need to get home and for whatever reason, like, you can schedule either a time that's less busy, either at the first appointment or the last appointment, or go if you live in an area that there are different kinds of mikvahs, like maybe in one city, it gets a lot of women and in another city, it gets fewer women. You know, you can schedule an appointment at a time when it's less busy so that you can take the time to pray in the water. And I think that also a lot of times we're not even aware, sorry for interrupting you. No, no, you, please. But- it's, it's totally okay to ask for that time, even if your mitzvah is busy. It's okay to say, can I just have another few minutes by myself even? Like sometimes, you know, we, we don't want to have a mitzvah lady standing there when we're pouring out our heart. And I think it's so important to know that you have the right to say, I just need a few minutes by myself. Is that okay? And sometimes it's good to like kind of prepare her, but you don't have to tell the mitzvah lady your whole story. Right. It's okay to just say, I'm going through a hard time and I really would like to have this as a place to daven. Could you give me a few minutes? And most of them will be thrilled yes. to do that. Yes. Um, and, you know, and even if she says, oh, but I, can, I don't know if I could leave you alone, most will be happy to give you a few seconds. And I really think that that's a very big thing. Another, we were just publishing, and thank you for helping to sponsor a beautiful booklet called Birkat Emuna, which doesn't speak to everybody, but I think it has so many powerful different things in it between tips about going to mikvah and people's 
um, modern and ancient tefillot that um, uh, prayers of all different kinds that women have written um, about loss, about uh, about stillbirth, about all different kinds of topics. Um, and it also has a framework for the partner to say at the time when a woman is going to mikvah, because you're not in it alone, you're a partner with somebody, and right. the mikvah can be a place to also think about that. And also, I mean, obviously, the mikvah is also a segue to sexuality. So um, thinking about, like, the difficulty of that piece within it, um, Birkat Emuna tries to give tips also for the partner and also for you to, to be thinking about, you know, and at least conscious of how it can be difficult in a time when you're going through whatever aspect of infertility and loss you are. Um, and what I love about Birkat Emuna is that it has lots of different things because different things speak to different people. Right. So some people need the time in the mikvah to daven, and some people want to bring along a candle and say, like, this is the place where I can make an neshama, but I also want to recognize the neshama that I lost. Or, you know, as I said before, bringing a friend along can also really be very comforting for somebody. And that might not speak to you at a certain point in your life, but there really are so many different types of things. And I actually find that for me, um, one of the things that I found most helpful as a tool, I have found at times when I was going through loss, was to sort of use each um, dip in a different framework. So I like to, I, I personally dip three times. I know a lot of women dip three, some dip two, some dip four, some dip seven, doesn't matter, you could break it up. But to concentrate and focus your tvilot with a different thought, like one is to start with um, looking back at the past, what you've been through, the process that you've gone through, um, recognizing it, um, there might be thankfulness for what you did have or the process that you've been through, and there may also be hurt, and you need to recognize that. The next um, tvila is for recognizing where you are at the present, which might be I'm not ready to move on, or I'm still hurting, or it might be I am ready to move on, uh, wherever a person is, but giving voice to that in your thoughts and even really like saying, you know, with your bracha, you know, this is my, where I am now and what the kind of koach, the, the force that I want to bring into my next tefillah. And the third tefillah for me has always been a future looking, you know, asking to, to have the, the right bracha to be open to whatever is coming in the next stage because we don't know what it is, but for us to be open to whatever the next stage is going to bring. And obviously you pour out your heart in whatever direction that is, you know, for some women, that's please let me be pregnant. And yep. for some people, that's let me move to the stage where I can accept, you know, adoption or where I can, everybody's in a different stage. Right. Um, I, whatever I, I, it is. I, I, I love that. I like just got chills as you were talking, like just this concept of, like, I also personally dip three times. And this concept of past, present and future, I think is like, it's incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. I, I mean, for, for me, I, you know, at the time when I was going through all of my stuff, I would take a very long time in the mikvah. I would do my three dips very quickly, but then I would spend a long time afterwards and just cry and cry and cry and pray and cry. And it's interesting in my local mikvah. So like, you know, I'm many years past that point, thank God, but I still take that time every single month that I'm in the mikvah, and I still take that time and pray. My The mikvah ladies in my local mikvah know already, they're like, kosher, kosher, like one says kosher after you dip to make sure that you go in. So they say kosher, kosher, kosher after my three dips, and they're like, take as much time as you need. We're leaving, you know, do, I, they know already that I'm going to be there for a while. <laughs> so it's, and, and now for me, the prayers that I give up are the prayers for this community, the prayers for Shalom Bias for, you know, peace in my home currently, the prayers for people in my life who I know are going through difficult things. So now my prayers have changed, but I still take the opportunity 
to use that time and to pray. Um, I think that also it's really important um, to recognize the place of your partner also. I mentioned that before, but like sometimes you need to, or it helps to be davening that you and your partner should be on the same page. They should be able to be supportive of each other, whatever you're each going through, because you're not going through the same right. thing. Right. Um, and I think that's really important also in terms of taking that time and where one might want to direct their thoughts. You know, and sometimes it really is like you've really been highlighting this week how hard it is. <laughs> and I think for many people, it really is hard. So even though I'm giving that spin of how we could possibly use that time, I want to make sure to give voice to the fact that it's not easy to do that. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we really are just in the place of crying um, and, and pouring out our hearts, and that's okay. Right, right. It's totally okay. Um, I, another thing that I, I mean, you, you brought up, like, as we were talking about the, the asking for time or requesting time, but I, I think is also, I wanted to ask you about what your thoughts are about this. Some people, like, when they're going through something difficult, you know, they'll ask for a first appointment or they'll ask for a last appointment because they know that they need more time. But they're, they're worried that the mikvah attendant is going to ask them questions like, why do you need it? Are you like, are, are you a call? Like, uh, like, are you a bride or are you a this? like, like they're, they're going to just start asking you questions about why you need sort of special treatment. And, and that deters them from asking for what they need. And so I just wanted to, from your perspective, what is the best way for people to do that so that they can get what they need out of mikvah, knowing that it's going to be hard for them, but there are ways to make it easier? So first of all, again, I want to emphasize that like, it's really okay to take the time whenever you're there and that people should feel like they can. They're allowed to ask and that's okay. Secondly, if you feel like you want to go first and last. I, oftentimes I feel like it's because I don't want to see all my neighbors or, you know, somebody else when I get to the mikvah. Like I want to go first because I know I'm going to be a mess and I don't really want to have to be like, hi, how are you to everybody else? So, um, so I think with mikvah ladies, it's actually okay to say I'm going through a difficult time and I want to have a little bit of quiet to, you know, around mikvah. Um, just to connect. And therefore, I'm asking you if I could have, and if they start, um, you know, asking, I think it's really okay to say, it's not something I want to discuss right now, or I'm, unless you feel like sharing with them, but it's totally legitimate to just say, I don't want to discuss it. And I really appreciate your respecting that because, I, because, you know, as a mikvah lady, you see so much, I'm not in the place where I can discuss it, but I appreciate your respecting my needs. It doesn't have to be any more than that. <laughs> Beautiful. No, look, and, and, and you're a thousand percent right. Like, that's the way to just say, like, I'm going through something. I don't want to talk about it, but, like, I need you to just give me what I need. Like, I, I love that. I love that. What, what other pointers or, or thoughts do you have for this community about how to make it easier? Um, well, I, first of all, sometimes the reframing um, for yourself is very helpful. Like a lot of times we get this um, message that mikvah is about fertility, 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 and we know it comes out right around time and, you know, we want to have the bracha, but mikvah is about a lot of different things. Mikvah is about connecting to myself. Mikvah is about connecting to my partner, not only in the, the realm of fertility, but also just in our relationship and strengthening our relationship and being together as a couple, and sometimes, as I mentioned before, intimacy can be so difficult when you're going through fertility issues because, like, it's so fraught. But if we can even use mikvah night to sort of, like, put a little bit of a bracket around that and, like, for ourselves, I need pampering right now. I need this time for myself, and I'm not thinking about my fertility journey, if that's possible. Um, I'm just thinking about, you know, me as a person, and I need a break. Or, I, you know, I want to concentrate on, like, the shalom bayit that's needed to see eye to eye with my partner, to be on the same page about different things, whether that has to do with fertility or not, is so great. And it really helps um, in, in the process. And I actually recently was speaking to somebody who's a fertility therapist, and she said that 
um, oftentimes th there was a recent article that came out about how fertility and IVF is often more successful when we don't feel like this is our last chance and it's the only chance that we have and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's like a whole, and so often we put so much on like mikvah night is, and I'm like, hold on a second, pull back a second. This is not your only chance. This is not the only time. This is not, this is a time for you to connect to yourself. This can be a time for you to like, you know, connect to God in a whole different way. And even if it's like being angry as anything, right. um, but, but to say, where do I need, what do I need? And not just, well, everybody tells me it's about fertility. So, you know, if we refocus and we remember that sometimes my saying, I'm choosing to continue with my treatments. And that's a choice that I'm making. Yep. Um, and, and I, and I want to put the positive spin on it of like, you know, my relationship is also important. I'm also important. And I'm choosing to do this from a good place. Not because I have, to. yes, I understand that I have to, but, right, but, right, right. but also, but I am active in this process, right? I'm active in my relationship. I'm active. Like I want to do that. I also, I'm choosing to come to mikvah. I could give this up. Right. So as much as we want to like hate every second of it, which many of us do, um, but we are choosing to stay inside. And if we're choosing to stay inside, can we also choose to see something positive in it and to make something positive out of it? Again, we're not always at that place, but if we can, I think we give ourselves a lot, a lot of um, strength within our choices to be able to do that. Right, and I think that there, are, you know, I, I love so much of what you said, and I, the the piece that I'm like choosing I, right at this moment that's speaking to me is the concept of like, this is hard. We're not saying it's not hard. Like we're all agreeing it's hard, and it's especially hard if you have fertility challenges. But if there's one piece of the hardness that you can hold on to that you can carve out for yourself, then we're not saying that that's going to overtake your, your whole experience. And like, now you're going to be la di da and like, this is like the best thing since sliced bread. But if there's one corner of it that you can own and make it something that works for you and is meaningful for you, then try, like tr try to find something that, that you can hold on to that, that gives you a little bit of that, that boost, that chizuk, that, that little bit of warmth. Um, yeah. I, I really think, I mean, I think that that's actually true for every single woman who goes to the mikvah, no matter where she is in life. A thousand um, percent. A thousand percent. But okay. Doubly true. So if you're going through fertility, yeah. Definitely. Okay. So, so to sort of close this out here, um, in, in, like, in the grand scheme of things, like this, your work is all about like trying to make sure and trying to both empower women who are doing this mitzvah and give them pieces of positivity and talking about all the different aspects. I'm now like trying to like take all of your work and like condense it into two sentences, which is obviously never going to happen, but I'm trying, but you're going to help me afterwards. Um, and, and really try to infuse positiveness and spirituality and meaning into the different aspects of mitzvah but also to train the others and train the Balanites and the mikvah attendants to help support all the people who are coming so that they can give people the space to be able to do what they need and support them in a way that feels warm and inviting at a time when things may not be as, they're not coming to the mikvahs in their full heart, so to speak. Did I, did I, did I miss anything is the question. What, what did I miss? No, we, we, you pretty much caught what we do. Um, and, and uh, we also try to give voice to the hard pieces, but definitely training the trainers and also women in the community, um, providing resources about mikvah and about how it impacts in the intersection of our lives. Um, and I really want to invite the, the Birkat Emunah has been really powerful in Israel and, um, we're, we are making it available in the States now, thanks to the generosity of a lot of organizations and donors. Um, and I want to invite people who are interested 
to get a copy of Birkat Emuna, www.edencenter.com backslash Emuna, E-M-U-N-A 2021. Um, and you can go on there and get a, and order a copy. And also the truth is that um, we're definitely looking for women in their communities or people who in their communities want to be a point person to bring it to the mikvah, to bring it to the local shul, to bring it to other women who are going through fertility issues, to bring it wherever. And so on our website, um, you can mark that you'd like 10 copies or you know more copies um, so that you can help to pass it on to other people. And I, what I think is really beautiful about it, it was such a conglomeration of what different people have written um, along with traditional things. So um, it, in some ways, it kind of sums up some of what the Eden Center is trying to do with melding the practical and the spiritual, looking at um, the, the emotional aspect, as well as, you know, this doesn't even deal with halakha at all, because we realize that going to the mikvah is so much about how does it meet me and how do I meet it, and hopefully giving some practical um, help and advice in that process. Right, and, and for clarification purposes, I mean, I've seen it, the, the Birkata Muna is specifically for individuals who are going through fertility challenges. It is, that, that is its target. It's, it's, it has beautiful pieces, as, as um, Dr. Gramet said about, you know, individuals going through infertility, some who have been through loss, stillbirth, and then speaking from the partner's um, perspective, but it is specifically designed for this community, for the fertility community. Um, and so I, you know, one of the other reasons why we really wanted to bring you not only at this point, because, you know, you are one of the gurus who really, you know, helps bring mitzvah into people's homes in a way that's more powerful and meaningful, is that this specific Birkata Muna is really an incredible tool for people to have in their lives and to bring into their community. So we'll link that afterwards for people to be able to go back and take a look at it. Great. Okay. I, you know, to me, it means so much that there are organizations across the spectrum who work in fertility, who have supported it, um, because it really is something that I think speaks to a wide range of individuals um, and not just, you know, it, it could really speak to you at all different points of your own personal process, because we all go through ups and downs. Um, and, you know, right after you might not be wanting or looking for anybody else's, you know, thoughts, but then later looking for, wait a minute, how did other people manage to get through this? And I'm having such a difficult time. What else is out there? So we try to bring those things together. Um, and I, I'm really proud of how it brings Israeli voices and American voices and lots of different things together. So absolutely, and and you're you're I mean you're obviously speaking on it, uh, uh, touching another really beautiful point. Like we all know that this work is inherently emotionally charged. Like uh, when we talk about all of these topics, it it's very painful for some people when they're dealing with it right at that moment. But there are times that you do want to reach out and do need that extra reinforcement and that chizuk and the beer Karamuna is really a beautiful um, tool to be able to reach to. So thank you so much for being here. I know this is just the beginning of, you know, lots of different kinds of conversations about mikvah, both with you and with other voices, but we are so grateful, especially the first night of Hanukkah, that you're here and we thank you so, so much. And we will link all of the resources and the, um, and the page and the Eden Center to make sure that people can find you. Great, and thank you. Really, now that I'm about to go light candles, you know, the light of Hanukkah starts small and gets bigger and we all have um, the power to increase the light, um, not in a kish way, but I think that that's what, you know, tradition comes to say, that we're all part of the process and we continue that process and whatever way we do. So Amy, you do that amazingly um, by just, you know, bringing the different voices together and enabling the conversation to grow to such a place where you really, you know, the light comes out by feeling we're all part of a community together and you do that amazingly. So I mean, we you. should, we should all continue to work together to do all of this work. I mean, Happy Hanukkah, everybody, and we will continue this over the course of the week.
Okay. All right. Take care. Thank take you. Care. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.